Hello, Working Preachers. This is Rolf Jacobson kicking off the official first day of our fall fundraising campaign. I wanted to take a moment to let you know that all gifts made during the fall campaign will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make a gift during the fall campaign, November 1st through the 30th, we will send you a free ebook titled Youthful Sermons. Youthful Sermons is a workbook to help young people preach their first sermon with mentoring from their pastor. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for All Saints Sunday, which falls on November 7, 2021. If you are looking for the podcast for the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, you can pop over there and it's available. Uh, but this is the podcast for All Saints Sunday, if that is what you are remembering this particular festival Sunday. And the texts for All Saints this year are Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. The psalm is Psalm 24. Revelation 21, 1 through 6a. And the gospel reading is John 11, verses 32 through 44, a section of the raising of Lazarus. Should we start there? Yeah. Are we going to disagree about what happens to Lazarus? Uh, no, because we don't act. Well, uh, well, I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. All we'll right. see what happens. See where it goes. Okay. Uh, what but- happened to Lazarus? I think he's resuscitated. Yeah, and I don't. Oh, so. we're going to disagree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's not where I was going. I, uh, I want to focus on uh, particularly uh, this year, one of the things that I've been really struck by uh, in this past year, and it has to do with some work that I'm uh, doing with a, with a, a book, uh, but uh, bringing trauma theory to uh, the interpretation of scripture and that uh, and and inviting preachers this year to to note that uh, it, it, kind of an obvious thing, but it's it's worth noting that you know this whole this whole chapter, at least up into the raising of Lazarus, is called the raising of Lazarus. When actually the raising of Lazarus is only two verses. Uh, it's forty three to forty four. That the narrative space is given to uh, the grief and the trauma of death and uh and that that we uh, that we acknowledge the ways in which scripture does give space for uh grief and trauma and and the way the the resurrection narratives you know before that before they were lilies and trumpets and peeps and all of that are really trauma narratives uh why isn't that mary why is it that mary magdalene doesn't recognize Jesus because it's impossible in that moment uh, for her to do so. And, and so that maybe, and so we look at that narrative space of these characters uh, sitting in the, the absolute trauma of death and, and the way in which that's where we are. Uh, uh, death, uh, death in our, in our immediate circles, whether that's, uh, a loved one due to due to COVID or communal uh, a communal somebody in our community due to COVID or another death, but just the the wide scale uh, number of death in the since we've been since all since we've been at All Saints from last year, and I and then that makes me really focus then on the weeping of Jesus that we hear the weeping of Jesus is, this is not a, this is not, this is not a sentimental uh, moment here, but that Jesus is weeping for uh, Lazarus. He weeps for uh, himself because he knows what's going to come. And he weeps for the reality of death in general because he knows what death does. Uh, he knows that death causes uh, separation that is that is beyond fathomable uh, 
uh, and grief that is beyond uh, beyond anything we can we can imagine being able to feel and getting through an experience, uh, and that maybe that's the first homiletical move this year uh, is that 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 Jesus weeps for uh, for what death uh, does for in our lives and what death brings, and uh, and maybe this year Jesus is weeping uh, even more. Uh, when we look at the last um, at the last year and the kind of death that we've had to uh, deal with and that we've had to um, experience, that's way more interesting than talking about resurrection and resuscitation. That's brilliant. I mean, it's really important stuff. That um, I, I think too of the way grief is so extended right now um, in so many communities. What psychologists call complicated grief when you're unable to uh, to practice grieving in the kind of the culturally sanctioned or normative ways that we're all used to because you know you get practice in learning how to grieve deaths but there's there's such a backlog of grieving over the last two years um that that trauma gets just more and more um that's the word i want it's intensified yeah so mm -hmm crucial to provide, I think, space for some of that just to come out this Sunday in addition to mm -hmm. the preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's why, I think I think that's exactly right, you, uh, Matt and Caroline. And I think that's why people don't remember All Saints sermons, but what they remember, they do remember the ritual of maybe going up and lighting a candle, uh, especially though, I think people remember that ritual. If, if your congregation does something like that, which I strongly urge, um, especially people will remember for the rest of their lives going up and lighting it for the, the first time after the death of somebody. So this will be the first All Saints since my mom died, since my uncle died. Uh, and most intensely, believe it or not, since uh, very recently, my cousins, my first cousin's 30 year old son died unexpectedly. So my extended family has just been through three weeks, actually uh, 15 days of really intense um, mourning together. Um, and then leaning into then the All Saints experience and uh, we're obviously recording this before All Saints, and I'm very much looking forward to the to that grief ritual as part of All Saints. Um, so to come alongside that with the sermon, uh, talking about whether it's talking about uh, Christ wiping away every tear, or talking about that God feels. I mean, the one of the big one of the big um, I don't know assertions of the biblical about the biblical God is that God feels. This is one of the things that made Marcion uh, reject the Old Testament because Marcion wanted an unmoved mover, right? a God who is unmoved emotionally. Uh, somehow he and others in the Hellenistic world saw, thought that idea was um, uh, ridic ridiculable. I don't know what the word um, I'm looking for is, but that is Jesus weeps, God actually feels our pain and feels pain because of us and on, on our behalf. I think that's a very important uh, piece of our biblical faith. I appreciate uh, Ben reminding us of the numbers. Uh, uh, currently, the COVID numbers worldwide is approaching 5 million. Uh, and uh, in the U.S., approaching 750,000 deaths. And for that reason, this uh, recognition of the reality of death, and in this particular text, uh, as Caroline opened us to remember, that just in the midst of that moment, how dare us think it natural to expect some... Um, easy resurrection, some easy fix. We, we need to linger in the lament to, to, um, to tra 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 traverse this territory of grief uh, 
uh, I am uh, reminded uh, shortly after my mom died that a friend of mine uh, shared with me a text. And I don't know if, if she, it's a quote someone gave her uh, or if this was her own writing, but uh, the words are, grief is a foreign territory with rules all its own that one only discovers by traversing the unwelcome tra travain, terrain. One unwelcome reality is being bone tired and un but unable to calm the mind and heart to receive deep rest. And that is exactly the promise that Jesus makes to us. I mean, not in this text, but that that's one of the, the promises that we will be given rest. And this is the one place where it feels at, at least at the when 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 death enters into our home, into uh, directly into our lives. How do you rest from that? How do you how do you feel peace in the midst of that? And for me, it's knowing that God grieves too. It's knowing that God is vulnerable here too. It's knowing that God also, in the midst of that grief, in the midst of that vulnerability, has power over even death. And walking that terrain with God is hope filled because of what God can do and does do in the midst of that grief. Should I go to Isaiah? It's such a great text, you know, both here and when it gets uh, recalled in, in Revelation 21. Mm -hmm. uh, just a great promise, um, especially in the midst of whether it's personal grief or just the numbing loss of so many people. And, and, and that's something else, too, I think, that for preachers to think about ways to help your congregation grieve for strangers as well to to open people up to the, you know, the, those numbers are, are immense in terms of loss, but just the, the numbness of all of this. Uh, but here's the promise, right? As Corinne Carvalho says in the commentary, God will swallow up the swallower, uh, you know, that, you know, moat, this, this, this deity of, of death that just travels the earth with its jaws wide open, swallowing up uh, people, you know, this, um, this image of just destruction uh, will become, you know, the victim of God's own design as well. Which similar, you know, this is not one of the texts, but First Corinthians 15, right? The last enemy to be defeated is death itself. Um, so there's promise, right? There are these promises in here that are huge, aspirational, but how that can pull us into doxology the way the book of Revelation does. I know we're doing Isaiah, but I find it helpful to think of those two together. No, I do too. Um, the thing that always strikes me about this text is um, the first image in it, though, is of a feast. Um, and, and maybe this is a time to... Uh, so let me just talk about that for a minute, that um, most of the Old Testament, including this passage, uh, was written before money existed. Um, they had silver that they used for exchange, but not money. Uh, the, um, the first money was um, silver that, that somebody, that the government had said, yes, this weighs a shekel, that it, you know, it's an agreed weight. And from that, then eventually money uh, as an abstract concept. But so before money, what's the image of abundance? And the, and the primary image of abundance in the Old Testament is the feast. And so... So God, you know, uh, here's the picture the poet paints for us, uh, a feast of the best food and, and the best wine, um, and that it's going to be for all people, this incredible feast. And that's one of the ways we, we also grieve and we mark things like that is we do have, uh, we do have feasts at uh, both that, that mark our best days and and we bless each other with food in the midst of grief. You know, the one thing people know how to do when someone's going through trauma is to bring food. Um, so I just, that image of the feast, 
and uh, when we say, when we sing in, in, when some of us that have come from liturgical traditions sing that this is the feast, it's not talking about communion now, which is a foretaste. It's talking about the feast of victory that Revelation, the book of Revelation is saying will come for, for all people. I really appreciate that uh, setting um, uh, that we're not talking about just this uh, little uh, moment today. We are anticipating and uh, that this text, as uh, Matt has uh, repeatedly said, and, and you're saying as well, Rolf, is about this, is repeated and we think we know it from Revelation, from the New Testament, because that's where we read it. But it is the assurance of a covenant, of a promise that was made um, to the people of God it, uh, from from the very beginning, from the be from from the beginning, if you if you hear the echoes of the creation story, where there um, uh, in um, uh, in the the creation story, the the food that is available for all of humanity and the animals is sufficient in the seeds of of the plants. Um, so this abundance for all is from the very beginning. And uh, I love the fact that you called us to linger here, to know that in the midst of grief, in the midst of um, uh, lament, in the midst of loss, that's the words I'm looking for, in the midst of grief, in the midst of loss, we have this eternal promise that God has provided for us and that we can celebrate and come together. And as a single person who's eaten a lot of meals alone, I really love the fact when I'm invited to gather with others, um, even if it's only one other, to break bread and to uh, share drinks, um, even if it's just a ginger ale with lime, my favorite drink, um, but to be able to do that with someone else who understands the reality of my moment, whether it's celebration or grief, and we can journey together in this. The psalm, do we wanna say anything about the psalm? I, you know, one thing that is, as we were talking and, and looking at uh, particularly the Isaiah text and, and the Psalm 24 and Psalm 24 uh, and you know, the ways in which this, you know, the imagery and metaphors around, around feast and, and, uh, uh, and the presence and activity of God in the midst of, uh, in the midst of our our suffering and our grief, and and uh, and so we have a reference to salvation or God saving in Isaiah, and then then of course again in the Psalm, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God, the God of their salvation. And I'm not sure if I would go here, but. You know the way in which we uh, that that frequently salvation is connected to uh, either either Jesus' death or or the you know or Jesus' resurrection or the way in which we tie salvation or what is it, toward a, a kind of future reality uh, in terms of we also will be raised from the dead just as Jesus was raised from the dead uh, and. And yet what we're getting in these texts, and then I think in this, in, in our conversation here, uh, is a, 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 a way to think about salvation that is here and now, that, that, that part of our God is a saving God that, that's not uh, postponed to uh, a, a post-death existence, but uh, that, that in breaking of God's salvific activity, uh, that we think of the salvation, and we're really going to get that, um, I think, a, a little bit in, in Revelation as well, that, that salvation is very much tied to the dwelling of God um, in our grief and in that presence. And um, so it just, it just, I think, breaks open a little bit to, like, what does it mean that we have a God of salvation uh, and that, that our God is a saving God and engages in salvific acts. And um, I, I don't know if that's going to be a direction that the preacher takes, but it, I think it's one aspect of, of uh, all saints and one aspect of these texts that one could explore theologically. All right, so thanks, Carolyn. Um, all right, let me go in a weird direction to first, it's going somewhere, just trust me. So um, 
as I said, we've had a bunch of family uh, funerals lately. It's at my uncle's committal. Um, I got to the chapel and this is one of these big um, cemetery uh, operations that they have multiple chapels. So, uh, and they're used by all different kinds of faith and non-faith. And so uh, when I, I got to the chapel early, of course, and um, there was a stack of uh, little um, folders for a, a Jewish funeral that had happened. And it had the, uh, uh, it had the, the funeral, the mourner, the mourner's Kaddish, uh, which I had never looked at before. Um, and the mourner's Kaddish um, doesn't mention death. What it does is simply praises God uh, for God's greatness. And uh, it's, it, the, the idea is when we're in the midst of things we cannot understand, like the death of a loved one, that part of the mourning and grief is nonetheless to bear witness to God's greatness. And that's what I think that's what Psalm 24 does here at the end. It may seem like a really odd thing to do to, uh, on all saints when we remember death to, to talk about how great God is, but that, it does actually have a function in mourning uh, that I learned from this little folder. Can we um, move on to Revelation? We were making the connection, of course, between Isaiah and Revelation that uh, God will wipe away uh, every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Uh, and, I, and I think there's a good connection to what you were just talking about, Rolf, is that we hear in this passage uh, words of promise. See, I am making all things new. And, uh, and, and the promise of, of the way in which God is, God is our beginning and our end. Uh, that uh, that going back to the beginning of Revelation, where I am the Alpha, the Omega, the one who is. It's always interesting that the that the first verb tense is present tense, the one who is and who was and who is to come, and and which really then emphasizes uh, the promise of of. Uh, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, seeing the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell, God will dwell with them. That, that's that verb, skenao, which uh, is used in, of course, John 1.14. Uh, and this is the only two places actually in the New Testament that the verb is used of this promise of God's dwelling. And so, you know, going back to uh, John, uh, the the, the raising of Lazarus, and then here that the, the promise we praise God or we rejoice because God is, is dwelling, tabernacling, <laughs> tenting with us uh, in, in everything, in, the, in this, uh, in our grief and in our uh, uh, trying to make sense of what, how to navigate that, that that's the, and that, and that, that, that promise and that reality is uh, what is our response going to be to that? Uh, and, the, and then it, it can be joy, can be rejoicing in the midst of, in the midst of what we're experiencing. And I think also, see, I am making all things new. I find that to be really, uh, really uh, inviting <laughs> in that uh, there's a promise in that too, that I think some people might need to hear where, uh, where are we looking for that newness even in the midst of what we're experiencing now? Uh, are we, are we, do we have a perspective of fear and foreboding uh, that the sky is falling, sort of the chicken little syndrome uh, and not to discount that truth and that reality, but, uh, but are we looking for the newness of God? Do we have that perspective that God might be up to something, uh, something new? Uh, not, not, not that the trauma will go away. That's, I think that's an important aspect that uh, Shelley Rambo says, there is no going back to life before the storm. Uh, but, but part of the Christian promise rea of reality is there is no going back to life uh, before an empty tomb. And, but, that, but that empty tomb remains in our present. Uh, and, and, uh, and so I, I guess, part of where I would go with the sermon on Revelation is, is thinking about uh, some, of those, uh, some of those truths that this text is promising.
in this idea uh, also of uh, this is not something that is in the pot, in the sky by and by. Um, I, I'm struck by verse two um, that uh, the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Um, so often when I was taught to think about the presence of God and the promise of, of you know, death no more, um, uh, 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 of us being in full community, it was after I die, somewhere out there. And this text actually points to the foretaste of when Christ returns. And it's here and now. Uh, just as we talked about the communion meal uh, is, is a foretaste of the feast, the banquet that we're actually singing about. Uh, how, how do we live out practices today, here and now in the communities where we are, where people experience a glimpse of, of, of community, a glimpse of um, a relief from sorrow, a, a glimpse of, of uh, removal of pain, uh, the, the capacity to laugh in the, in the midst of, of sadness. Every time that happens, we get a glimpse of God. We get a glimpse of God's intention for the world. And uh, Dean Trulier, uh, Harold Dean Trulier, uh, preached a sermon that uh, I stole for him, stole from him with permission, though I'm sure he doesn't remember that I asked, but I'm just giving a shout out here, where he talks about the kingdom of heaven not being ready yet. And so we have this foretaste every time we experience community here on earth, that heaven comes down. And uh, he ends it by saying, this is why we sing Blessed Assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. And he uses this image of uh, baking a cake and how great it is, at least when I was a kid, to, um, to um, you can't do this now because it's not safe, but to, to eat the dough while you're waiting for the cake to bake. And that, that sometimes it's, it's better to, sometimes kids wait to eat that dough before, you know, more than eating that cake. And that foretaste, that expectation, I think it's something we lose. And Revelations is that promise uh, and I just, hearing him preach that sermon changed the way I expect to hear anyone preach from Revelations. And that is to say, where do we see glimpses of the city, the new city here on earth? And I think that's what Jesus did in the tears before raising of Lazarus. I think that's what all of the promises of scripture are as we wait for the coming of the presence of God. And that's what gives us hope in the distractions of the storms and trauma that is our reality now.